Welcome back, everyone. We're so grateful that you're staying with us. This is week six of the relentless courage of a scared child. Um, before we get in to the big lessons that or takeaways from the book, um, we have two winners uh, that we're going to report this week. <laughs> One from Crayboy. I have learned a lot of valuable information. My 16-year-old daughter deals with ADHD, anxiety, depression, and at times suicidal thoughts. Yeah. This podcast has been very helpful and given me great tools as I work to help mm. her. We love that. That is one of the reasons we do this. So Crayboy will be one of our winners awesome. this week. So as we wrap up the relentless courage of a scared child, what do you think are some of the big lessons to take away from the Salvation Army, from your crazy childhood, cancer, playboy, um, you know, your dad, your sisters, just all of the incredible people we really meet in this book. So um, I think the first big lesson, and I know this isn't just about me. I mean, I know that my life, as crazy as it was, is actually not that uncommon. So I know so many people are going through similar situations with taking, being asked to take care of family that they don't really want to get involved with. Um, one of the big lessons is, you know, is, is when you argue with God, you, you often rob yourself of an opportunity to heal and to grow. And so that was a big one for me because I just could not have anticipated over and over again. I mean, I kept doing, making the same mistake, but over and over again that I was being asked to do and called to do certain things that I didn't want to do. Um, and even though I was being asked to help, it, it gave me an opportunity to heal old, deep hurts and wounds. And that doesn't mean not drawing boundaries. It doesn't mean there aren't, aren't some people that you just know you can't have in your life because it's just a little too toxic. Um, or you help them from a distance, you love them, you know, from a distance. But when you know that it's, you know, you're being nudged to do something and you don't, you really rob yourself of that opportunity to heal. Well, I think another lesson is there's just a lot of reasons why people do what they do. It's yeah. not simple and it's easy to call people bad. It's harder to ask why. And that comes out in the book over and over. It does. Again. I mean, it, it's, I think two of my favorite chapters are probably the, you know, the chapter with my dad, the prodigal father, and then the chapter with my sister, um, because they were two of the hardest people for me to sort of reconnect with and bond with. And um, it was very, very difficult. But my sister said something to me when I was at my wits end with her. She said something to me that just really tr made a transformation in my own thinking. And that was, I'm so much more than my addiction. It sounds so simple. It sounds so like just a few simple words, but it really struck me because I had been seeing her as an addict, as opposed to this complicated person who has her own trauma, her own issues. Um, she just handles them differently than I do. And I remember for, for her birthday, she, the one thing she asked me for, I said, what can I get you for your birthday? And she said, you can go with me to an AA meeting. And I was like, absolutely not anything else. Like, what can I buy you for your birthday? And she's like, no, you insisted that I go to church with you. This is what I want. I, I had been so just adamantly against going to an AA meeting. Cause I just felt like I still, as much work as I had done, I still had trouble being around people who were still struggling with addiction. I could do it if I were in the position of teaching. It was really hard for me to go in the position of just listening. And being in the position of just listening was one of the most powerful experiences I've ever had. When you're teaching, you're not listening. When I was there just listening, I was like the pain that I heard. They weren't making light of their addictions. The pain I heard, the anguish I heard. Yes, sometimes they make jokes in order to survive it, to deal with it. But I was just like, wow, I mean, this is intense. And I really got a whole new perspective. So it was very interesting. I remember that day that you went and 
uh, it really blew you away. It blew me away. Yeah. I was just, you know, and, and she didn't even really realize like, you know, I was so quiet and she's like, I'm sorry I made you do that. And I'm like, no, I'm so glad I did that. Um, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I, it's just, it's, and I realized that I was resisting going because I was still struggling with my own pain. I was still struggling with my own wounds from the past. Well, and in some ways it really fits with society because society today is a lot of us versus them, Mm -hmm. you know, whether it's Republicans or Democrats, conservatives, liberals, um, you know, Americans, not Americans, it's Black and white. us versus them. Right. Um, you know, people have problems with drugs. People don't have problems with drugs. Whenever we see them as separate mm-hmm. from us, it's easy to judge them. It's well, easy to call them stupid or bad or incompetent or whatever term you might use but you know there by the grace of god go all of us from you know people could have had a head injury from that almost missed accident that so many people had or you, you know or bad thing trauma that happened and right in in life it just affects so many people so i think what people can take away from the book is empathy is learning how to decrease judgment and increase empathy. Well, and that's one of the things in the first chapter that I talk about is when I was able to stop seeing me versus them, when I was, you know, talking to a group of of people with addiction, um, I was able to see us all in that same place when we were all kids. We all grew up in trauma. We all had, you know, we were all scared children at one point. And when I could find that common ground, you know, which I think in society, just like you just said, if we could be Americans first before we are all these other things, if we could, be, we human, could be human, just human first right. and, and people who, you know, need help and just help one another, as opposed to, you know, all these labels we give each other, if we could find that common ground, which for me was scared children, for me, that common ground was scared children. Um, I was able to then build a bridge instead of a wall. So who in your life do you see as separate, Mm -hmm. as different, maybe is less than you? And, you know, our brain imaging work just teaches us over and over again. So easy to call people bad. It's much harder to go why in those four circles we always talk about. You know, is there biological issues, brain issues? Is there psychological issues, particularly trauma? Is there social issues? What's the modeling that you've experienced? And is there spiritual issues? Why do you care? What are your values? What are your sense of morality? All of those things matter. Um, We're so grateful that you joined us. What'd you learn? today. Um, Write it down. Uh, Many of you have done this and we're just really grateful. Write it down, take a picture Mm -hmm. and post it on any of your social media sites and hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. You can also go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com, leave us a comment, question or review. We'll enter you into a drawing. Crayboy was uh, our winner uh today and uh, end up with you know we'll send you a signed copy of the end of mental illness or tana's cookbook or her brand new book when it comes out january 5th the relentless courage of a scared child you can also sign up for our free event uh december 12th at yep 9 30 pacific time Uh, You're going to love it. We have great speakers uh, overcoming anxiety, depression, trauma, and grief. And oh, by the way, it will enter you into a drawing when you sign up to um, 
win a free scan and full evaluation at Amon Clinics. You have to actually be at the event though. You can't just sign up. You have to actually be at the event um, because the content's going to be so helpful and so wonderful. And you'll be able to share it afterwards if you want with someone you love. Um, but you got to be at the event, the live event in order to win the scan. So go to tanaamon.com forward slash event. Are you looking for ways to heal ADD, enhance your memory, conquer anxiety, depression, insomnia, autism, and other conditions? Hi, I'm Dr. Daniel Amen. We provide courses based on what we've learned over 30 years of clinical practice. We also offer accredited courses geared to physicians, therapists, and students looking to get ahead. Are you ready to change your brain and change your life get started today. Welcome back. Um, thank you for staying with us through these six weeks. Um, I've had so much fun just sort of telling you about my journey. It's been vulnerable, but it's also been wonderful. So I appreciate you sticking with us. We are talking about lessons and really hoping to turn it back to you and see how it applies to your life. We want to hear from you. And um, yeah, we're going to talk about lessons in this episode, but who's our winner before we get started? Well... Elgimo, helpful and thought provoking. As a school counselor, I work with a lot of children and mm. families and your podcast makes it possible for me to provide them with fresh mm. ideas and approaches to the brain health challenges they face. It aligns with my whole person integrative philosophy and helps me stay current on the go. Mm. I really appreciate the work you do. Thank you. It's awesome. So another big lesson. So we talked about empathy yeah. in the last podcast. I suppose maybe forgiveness yeah. is a good it's a big lesson, one. especially your dad's chapter. Yes. Um, you know, forgiveness is interesting. And I've been doing some of that on social media lately. And the the stories people have been telling me, the vulnerability they've been showing has been astounding. Um, and yeah, I, I get it. Nobody gets it more than I do that there are lots of reasons why people feel like they just can't forgive. But I think the thing that helped me most when I finally did the work was, was realizing that it was hurting him less than it was hurting me when I wasn't forgiving him. My bitterness was hurting me way more than it was hurting him. Um, he was struggling with his own demons, but I had spent decades not talking to him. So it wasn't hurting him. It was hurting me. And it was affecting many of my relationships. So when I could finally get to the place of saying, if I'm not willing to do it for him, can I just set it aside for now and do it for me and do it for my family and do it for my daughter and do it for you because it affected my relationships with men. Um, and when I finally realized that it's like, you know, this isn't about him as much as it is about my relationships with other people, my relationship with myself, healing my, and, you know, doing what, what God asked me to do. And it transformed everything. And then I was actually able to see the pain he was in. Well, and, you know, we've talked on this podcast before about forgiveness and have had some really powerful guests. And we talk about the reach Mm -hmm. method of forgiveness. And so when you think about your dad, the R in reach is recall what happened. Mm -hmm. And you talk about that in the book that he, he wasn't available right. to you. And when he was available to you, he preached mm -hmm. at you and shamed you and should you. While and he was not being authentic. And he, his he behavior was, was not authentic. He was not authentic and ended up stealing from the church and having doing affairs drugs and, and, right. um, and then being a motivational speaker, teaching people, you know, how to live their lives when his life was a mess and you couldn't stand the authenticity is well, authenticity is one of my top values. And so I certainly have not lived my life perfectly. But when I do something outside of my values, it pains me. And I didn't see that with him. So, so, so that's recalling what happened. The E is empathy. Mm -hmm. 
So why was he the way he was? His mother was severely depressed. Stepfather was abusive. Stepfather was abusive. He was disconnected from his biological father. Um, the early drug abuse mm -hmm. uh, clearly was an issue. So you can begin to understand why his personality was as flawed. As and, was. And, and I love that because it really did help me. But there came a point where I, I did finally let go and go, whatever the reason is, it's just going to have to be okay. For my sake, it's going to have to be okay. Well, and that's the A, which is altruistically for no good reason, right. except you give the gift of forgiveness, mm -hmm. which you did. I did. But I'm not going to say it was totally to. unselfish. It was fairly selfish initially. I grew into the unselfish part. That took time. But it did happen. But you forgave him and he ended up dying in your arms. With me praying for him. And we had, it was, I know it sounds crazy to have a death day be a beautiful day. It was a beautiful day. He completely released all of his shame and pain and, you know, just guilt over the past. And we were able to have these, you know, this really strong bonding moment. We prayed together and he died in my arms and you were holding his hand. It was just a beautiful moment. And the C is you commit to it. You tell someone, you told him. Um, in fact, you told him, I forgive you. Why can you not forgive yourself? Right. And I repeated something I had been told. Who are you to choose to hold on to something God has chosen to forgive? Like, that's pretty arrogant. I was like, whoa, that's heavy. <laughs> and the H is you hold on to it. Um and in that way, you can bless the other person. So recall what happened, empathize with why you think the other person did what they did. Altruistically, that's the A, give the gift of forgiveness. C is commit to it, tell someone about it. Mm -hmm. And H is hold on to it. Where are you holding a grudge? Mm -hmm. Where are you holding on to hurts? And who do you need to forgive? And maybe it's yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's someone else. But uh, I love what you say is when you hold on to hurt, you're actually poisoning yourself. So when you don't forgive someone, I heard this and I just held on to it. Um, if you refuse to forgive someone and hating someone else is like drinking poison and expecting the other person to die. I don't know who first said that, but it's very brilliant. <laughs> very wise. Yeah. There are a lot of characters in the book that needed some forgiveness. <laughs> Including me. I mean, you know, some of my trauma was self-induced and it, it had an effect on other people. But, you know, even though it was self-induced, as you write this story, you begin to forgive the little girl. Oh, yeah. And that was sort of the point was there's this evolution. And that's and it was and actually in writing it, I, I, I dug deeper. So I had done a lot of this work already. But when you write your story, there's something powerful that happens and you begin to realize so many things about yourself. And as I'm writing and I'm like, wow, I mean, I, I did there, there's so many things I had held on to for so long, you know, the shame, the self-loathing of certain decisions you make in your life that I know so many of you carry with you. Um, you know, people tell you, Oh, just be lovable. But what if you don't feel lovable? What if you don't like yourself? That's hard work. That takes a lot of introspection and, and hard work to be able to overcome that. And that takes forgiving yourself. So but when you do that, as I wrote my story, I began to, to sort of see what led me down that path to begin with. And so then from there, I was able to understand myself better and let that go. Yeah. Um, you know, I hope we, that works for you too. We would dearly love to hear from you. Who do you need to forgive? Uh, put the reach method into your life mm -hmm. and let us know how it works. Um, and it may not always work perfectly the first time. I mean, sometimes it takes a bit of work to do, but we would love to hear from you. Yeah. It's think of it like working out. 
it's like working a muscle. You can't do it once and think it's just going to happen. It requires consistent effort over time. I love that. It's so Mm -hmm. true. What did you learn today? Write it down. Take a picture of it. Post it on any of your social media sites. Hashtag Brain Warriors Way podcast. We're so grateful when you do this. The podcast has just been growing um, each week, which makes us so happy. Um, Leave us a comment, question, or review, a story on forgiveness uh, at to Brain Warriors Way podcast.com. We'll enter you into a drawing to win um, the end of mental illness or uh, Tana's book, either the cookbook or her new book when it comes out, The Relentless Courage of a Scared Child. You can also go to tanaamon.com forward slash event and sign up for our free event, December 12th, 9.30 a.m. Pacific time. And if you do, we'll enter you into a drawing to win a free scan and evaluation at Amen Clinics. It literally, like so many thousands of other people, can change your life. Stay with us. Welcome back. Uh, We are so grateful that you're with us and we're continuing on the last week for the relentless courage of a scared child. I have so many reviews uh, (laughs) to listen to. to pick one. This is from MH521. I've been tuning into their podcast now for a little while, and it's not only been very informative, but also very inspirational and empowering. Ever since my concussion, I've been seeking out many natural supplements and diet changes to help my recovery. Dr. Amen and Tana Amen's podcast have been instrumental in helping manifest positive change in my mental health and well being. I look forward to listening to more podcasts and consider both of them partners mm, in my love that. recovery. Love um, that. So today we're going to talk about finding mm-hmm. your voice. Isn't that when you post about finding your voice that you get a lot of comments? I do. And that sort of surprised me. I didn't realize how many people, how many women especially um, struggle with that. Um, but I, you know, I don't know why that surprises me because we're told to be polite and be quiet. <laughs> Most of our lives from the time we're little, it's like, be polite, be quiet, be a good little girl. And so were which you told that. Because of my five sisters, nobody told them to be quiet. <laughs> they were not quiet. I, I most, still, I go over my mom's and if everybody's there, I'm like, wow. Yeah, no, I think, I, think, <laughs> I think societally we teach our girls to be polite and quiet and we teach our boys to be powerful. And um, yeah. And so one of the reasons I love martial arts for women so much is because, you know, we key eye loud, we hit stuff and it's empowering um, as opposed to disempowering. But when I was young, I don't think I was taught that necessarily um, because my mom was pretty intense, but she is um, not quiet. She is not quiet. And your daughter is not not quiet. quiet. Well, I I intentionally (laughs) taught her that. So I intentionally taught her to use her voice. I always said, use your words. I would not let her get away with whining, pouting. Um, It's like, you're not getting it until you use your words. So that was a new. She had twelve word sentences when she was two. So right, and I never used baby talk. Right, like I never used baby talk with her. Um, so, and in fact, even at four, when we would go to the doctor's office, I would make her talk to the doctor. So I never wanted her to think that just because someone was in a position of authority that she didn't have the right to speak up. But I was a very timid child, so I was really timid when I was little because I not because someone told me. Um, It may have even been partially because my mom was so powerful, but I discovered that because of all the chaos in my life, it was safer to hide. It was just, I was afraid. So I was, I was, it was safer to just go away and hide somewhere. You know, she also has ADD, which we've talked about, and she was not a good listener. No. And would often talk over you. And if you have ADD, what you really want to work on is listening. Uh, well, I had to work on that so with my daughter. Important. 
Yeah. Uh, because when no one hears you, and it could be, you know, your mom or dad, their intention was great, but they didn't have the ability to inhibit the first thought that came into their head. And the more language they use, the more it often shuts people down. Yeah. Well, in my house, there was just yelling, screaming, chaos, drugs, people breaking in. I mean, it was just nuts. So I just, I figured out that it was easier to hide. Um, And it wasn't until I was molested when I was 12, a word I can finally say, um, that I realized being nice is not going to cut it. Now, at first, I went to an extreme other direction with it. I was this very, you know, attitudinal teen who was not very nice. Um, I used my voice a lot, but probably not in a very helpful way, not a very constructive way. But I thought it was better than being hurt. I was tired of being hurt. I was tired of being overseen. And so I went to an extreme. And so I could cut someone down pretty quick. And so I, it was this like sword that I was going to use. I used my voice as a sword, basically. It was like to keep people away from me. Um, it took time, just like a knight uses a sword for, you know, to protect, but not to just intentionally harm. I, it took time to learn to do that. That, that was skill. Um, but initially it was hard. But learning how to draw boundaries is such an important thing. Well, in another part of the book, where finding your voice was so important was working in the ICU at Loma Linda. Oh yeah. That was, yeah, that was a whole other thing, but I want to go back really quickly. So my mom never told me to be polite when I was little, cause she didn't have to, cause I was timid. When I found my voice, I was suddenly told be polite. And so what happened was after I was molested, um, I have an encounter with my stepdad. I never thought I'd have to see him again or talk to him again. And so my mom did a great job. She protected me. She believed me. And then I have this moment where I have to talk to him. And it was like a sucker punch. I hear his voice and I didn't really, I was like, whoa, I never, I didn't expect that to happen. And so it shocked me when I heard his voice on the phone and I was very rude. I was very rude and I still don't feel bad for it. But anyways, um, I was very rude and I yelled at him and my mom came around the corner and was like, Tana, be polite. And she sort of hissed it at me. Now, there are a lot of reasons she did that, right? I, the loss of control, the change, the sudden change in me shocked her. Um, and so she didn't know what to do with that. But I was resentful to her. I, was, I, I held a lot of resentment toward her for a long time because of that tan to be polite. And so it took so me time. So where in your life did you lose your voice? I, I think it would be good to think about it. And then how do you think you got your voice in a rational. Yeah, it was a roller coaster. I mean, it took time. Um, so therapy was one. I mean, I started, I love martial arts. Like I said, therapy for sure. Um, doing intentional training when you become a parent, dear Lord, I mean, parent training, (laughs) there's no book, but, but I intentionally, right. I intentionally started seeking out parent training because they don't come with an instruction manual. And when you're, when you are gifted a strong-willed child, Um, you have no choice, but to figure out how to temper your own, um, frustration because you got to learn how to, how to temper theirs, how to guide theirs. Well, and actually we have a great announcement that, um, Amen University, Amen Clinics, Tan and I, we just became the exclusive distributors for Love and Logic, the parenting program that I, I love, always love say and logic. saved my daughter's life. That's why we got involved with them. That's why we did this. But, but, but I intentionally took communication courses for that reason. So it was intentional on my part to take communication courses. It's like, I've got this, this voice now, what do I do with it? Yeah. But love and logic was a very important huge part of that because it taught you that you can, well, I think of it firm. as a communication course, <laughs> you can be firm and kind and help really plant responsibility. It's about coaching into children. It's about coaching. Early. It's not about taking control. It's about coaching. And it, it, it helped me so much because it's like, and it works not just with kids. It works like it really is a communication course. So it's, it's almost like when you are in this uh, power struggle with someone, you're both tugging on this rope. And what it teaches you is to let the rope go. 
<laughs> so you let the rope go and you let the person pay consequences. So you don't try to be in a power struggle. It's like you let the rope go, whatever happens, they need to pay the consequences for. And you're just there to coach them. You're there to love them, use empathy and coach them through it. And to create competent people. Right. And which is why. So in the near future, we're going to do a, a whole week of podcast with Charles and Jim Fay, and just talk about our excitement partnering with them. Yeah, some of my favorite uh, humans. Because, you know, one of the most stressful things you'll ever do is raise children. Especially uh, now. Especially now. Well, they're home. The and, right. So elevating your skill is just so important. All right. Finding your voice. So I'm so grateful to all of you for joining me on this journey. I would love to hear from you. Love to hear if you've been struggling, if you had feel like you had your voice taken away, or if you have your voice, how did you find it? Um, please write to me, tag me. You can find me on Instagram or Facebook. Also go to brainwarriorswaypodcast.com. Leave us questions, comments, and we would love it if you left us a review. Um, we should need to tell them about the event. We have been. December 12th. Uh, it's free, overcoming anxiety, depression, trauma, and grief. We have great speakers, um, Pastor Derwin Gray, who we just adore, Dr. Carolyn Leaf, Dr. Sharon May, JJ J. Virgin. J. J. Virgin, and you, and me, and you. Right. <laughs> um, so, December 12th, if you go to tanamon.com forward slash event, you can sign up for free and we will enter you into uh, a drawing to win a free evaluation with SpecScan at Amen Clinics. Stay with us. Welcome back. We are on our last episode of this series. So I'm super excited that you've joined us in the Relentless Courage series. Um, yeah, it's such a personal journey and it's just, it's wonderful to have our tribe join me. So we've been talking about lessons from the book uh, in this last week. And I think the last lesson that I really, really want to share with people that I, that I write about in the book is, um, you know, it's really about self-care and boundaries. But before we get too far down that road, I, I want to just share, um, I would love for you guys to look this up if you're not familiar with it. My favorite form of art is kintsugi, K-I-N-T-S-U-G-I, -I. kintsugi. It's a Japanese art form where um, they don't throw away broken pottery. So if pottery breaks, if it falls, it breaks, it shatters, they, they mend it with either platinum or gold. And they, they like have these gold veins and platinum veins in it and it's all put back together. And they don't think that it's less valuable because of the breaks. They think that it's more valuable because of the mending, because of those broken pieces. And so it's in that, it's in that mending that it becomes this beautiful piece of art. And when I read that, it actually made me cry because I thought, wow, I mean, we spend so much time and energy hiding our shame, hiding our brokenness, hiding the things that we believe that, that are so much, you know, that are, that are bad about ourselves or broken about ourselves. When in fact, I believe God sees that as the beautiful parts of us that we, if we give him the chance to mend that. And it's like, I believe that, you know, if we allow it, that we can all be so much better with, you know, God's golden healing, you know, golden mending, if you will. Well, I think that's one of the reasons I love this book so much, because it's really about turning your pain into purpose. And as a human being, you've become like this masterful piece of art that is really made up of many broken pieces. Um, yeah. And, Thank you. you know, we've, we've not told you how to pre-order the book. I mean, we'd love for you to pre-order the book. And if you go to Amazon or Barnes and Noble or anywhere great books are sold and 
pre-order it. You can also go to relentlesscourage.com. And well, if you, if you pre-order the book, go to relentlesscourage.com, just put in your order number and you actually have a whole Almost bunch of- Almost $500 worth of free gifts. Free gifts. Yeah. Tell them about the free gifts. So um, what I decided that I wanted to help people do on after writing this book, it's like, how can I help people after writing this book? Um, it's really all the things we've been talking about with these lessons. It's right, writing my story was so powerful for me. It's like, how can you begin to write your story? Because it helped me start to learn to see my life from an adult perspective instead of a child's perspective. So I began to get this more well-rounded, big picture view of, of the people in my life, even people that I was struggling with. And that helped me to release a lot of stuff. So I created a, a daily journal that you can use um, to start to journal your story. There's a four circle exercise to help you with yourself and with other people who you've been judging harshly, who you don't like, who you are struggling with, to begin to see their them as a whole person, biological, psychological, social, and spiritual. And we're going to be doing that at the event, at our free event, which we'll talk about later. So you get this exercise to help to put them together in this whole, like we talked about with my dad. I began to see his life through those four circles. He's not just this person who did bad things. He's this person with biology, psychology, social, and spiritual aspects to him that caused his behavior. Behavior is complicated. And then you get a course. Daniel, this is my favorite part of it, is we created a course. It's, it's not overbearing. It's not long, but it's powerful. And so there's a, a series of videos that we created that are just, you know, really well done that you can share with other people. Um, and there is the one page miracle. So, it's so important, one of the most important exercises I ever give to my patients uh, to really define what you want. And then whenever you go to do something, just ask yourself, does it fit? Does my behavior fit the goals I have for my life? And, you know, the reason why is because we want you to focus on what you want in life, not on what you don't want. Most people focus on what they don't want and that's what they get. So they get what they don't want because that's what they're focused on. So we want you to focus on what you want. And this book is about healing. And so that's why I created this, um, this package. And I'm going to match all pre-order sales and I'm going to buy a book and I'm going to donate it to someone in need. So we're donating them to women's shelters, to rehabilitation centers, to different places like that. Um, so we are donating a lot of books. I actually had one person, Paul Martinelli, who's just wonderful. He loved the book so much that he gave me $5,000 to donate books. So, um, it's a huge gift and we're just so grateful for that. Um, and we would also love for you to give it away. You know, we want to create a movement, you know, both Tan and I, we call the podcast, the brain warriors way, because we're trying to create a revolution in brain health. And part of it is learning how to understand, manage, and overcome the traumas you have experienced. And the relentless courage of a scared child is just such a great example on how to do that. So one thing I learned in when I started practicing martial arts, so, I mean, this was, you know, this was intentional as well. I had to learn this. But one thing I love about martial arts, and I never really realized the difference um, when I was younger, was assertiveness is not the same as aggression and you never want to be, you never want to be angry um, or aggressive, especially in any type of a self-defense situation, which would include um, protecting yourself even verbally, because if you are angry or aggressive, you actually are more likely to make a mistake and you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself or someone else. You need to be clear of thought and you need to be assertive. And that was such a powerful lesson for me. Cause I'm like, Oh, I got really good at being angry. <laughs> I went from being, you know, a victim as a child to being really good at being angry and keeping people away from me. But finding that place where you're assertive is how you make connections. And how do you think that applies to your work at Loma Linda? Oh, a, a lot. When you work in a trauma unit, a neurosurgical ICU level A trauma unit, um, it applies a lot. So, I mean, it's, you have to balance families who are in a lot of pain. And so you have to understand that when they lash out at you, it's because that's different. It's just because they're out of control and they, they're looking for some control. They need someone to, to blame and lash out at, and that's different, but you've got surgeons and you've got all kinds of people yelling at you and you've got people yelling stat code. It's nuts. And so if you don't learn how to sort of like be firm 
you, it's my job to protect that patient. And so even th- there are many times you've got new residents coming on and most of them are amazing, but occasionally they overlook something and you're like, you know, if you say something, you're going to get screamed at, which has happened to me many times. Um, and you got to figure out how to do that and you got to stand firm. So, so what are some practical tips for people to develop boundaries in their lives? So there's a couple things, firm and kind. I mean, firm and kind, we say it all the time, firm and kind. And whenever I'm about to lose it, I remind myself firm and kind, firm and kind, firm and kind. Does my behavior get me what I want? That's why the one page miracle exercise is so important. Know what you want and then match your behavior. Um, I also, when it comes to boundaries, I have my patients practice in the mirror. I have to think about that. Mm -hmm. So when someone asks you to do something, rather than just say yes, because you want people to like you, um, that'll actually teach people to run over you. Go, I have to think about it. And that way, go back and go, if I do this, does it fit the goals I have for my life? Do I have time? Do I want to? Does it fit? And so many of my patients live with should. Yeah. I should do this. You know, I call it the shouldn't shaming dragon. And I always want you to replace should with I want to. It fits my goals too. Yeah. I think another one is asking questions. So um, if you can just stop for a second and ask a question instead of just like launching into something, um, you know, before you launch into how you, you know, the anger that you're feeling, ask a question really quick. Um, get them engaged. And then, you know, it'll, it'll give you a second to buy some time. You have an example. Um, so rather than coming up and accusing someone, let's say you've got a situation at work or with your kids. Um, so where you, you know, you sort of know what the answer is, but you know, you're going to give them the benefit of the doubt because you, you want to avoid a conflict. It's like, sometimes I'll walk up and, you know, let's just say with my daughter and it's like, can you explain to me why you did this? I might already know, but it's like, can you explain to me, you know, what happened here or why you did this? It'll just buy me that second and get her talking as opposed to me just like launching into what I'm frustrated about. So I have an example early in the pandemic. I mean, we were making dinner and there were a lot of dishes and I sort of took the realm, the reign of making sure the kitchen stayed reasonably clean and people would just leave their stuff in the sink and they're all sitting around watching television. And I'm like, what do you think it would take (laughs) to get the dishes from the sink into the dish? What? And I'm just, what do you think it would take? (laughs) Um, And they responded in a positive way, but then the dishes just got from the sink to um, the counter. They didn't get put in the dishwasher or put away. And so a couple of nights later, I'm like, what do you think it would take? And, but by being firm and kind and persistent, ultimately the dishes got put away and I didn't feel like a slave. I love that. I have one more and it's, it's what helped me a lot. And it is sometimes when I couldn't figure out how to draw boundaries for myself, when it seemed fuzzy, um, my therapist actually taught me this. She's like, So what would you do if it was your daughter in that situation? Oh, it was crystal clear, like crystal clear if it was not me. Because sometimes I think if you've been traumatized, boundaries are hard for some of us. Boundaries become fuzzy. Um, If you've been traumatized, it takes time to work on learning how to draw boundaries because sometimes we don't feel worthy. We don't really understand what is a healthy boundary. But Sometimes if it's not about you, if you take yourself out of the picture and you look at it from a 30,000 foot view, or it's someone else that you love that you're protecting, it suddenly crystallizes it. So if you think to yourself, if this was my daughter or this was my mom or my sister or whatever it is, someone that you know you are protective of, how would I respond? If it's not the same way as you'd respond to yourself, then you know you're a little fuzzy on your boundaries. And therapy can be so helpful. Not where you just go and talk about oh, so your problems, but you learn skills. Um, and that's actually what research has found that works in psychotherapy. It's learning the skills mm-hmm. of daily living to help you be a more effective human. Yeah, I know John Townsend, our friend, he's done a lot of work on boundaries. And it was so helpful to me. And it's really just about 
you know, really learning to respect yourself enough to not let people take advantage of you, but at the same time, not using anger and aggression. So um, if you would pre-order the book, we would be so grateful. Um, Also come to our free event, Overcoming Anxiety, Depression, Trauma and Grief, December 12th, uh, where we're gonna enter people into a drawing to win a free evaluation and scan at Amen Clinics. If you're enjoying the Brain Warriors Way podcast, please don't forget to subscribe so you'll always know when there's a new episode. And while you're at it, feel free to give us a review or five-star rating as that helps others find the podcast. If you're considering coming to Amen Clinics or trying some of the brain healthy supplements from BrainMD, you can use the code PODCAST10 to get a 10% discount on a full evaluation at amenclinics.com or a 10% discount on all supplements at brainmdhealth.com. For more information, give us a call at 855 978-1363.